Today's video was suggested to me by Tim, one of my Patreons. I can't thank you enough for your support. On the 1st of July 1940, the world's third largest suspension bridge was open to the public but within three months would be just a pile of twisted metal and concrete. You might be thinking that it was some kind of espionage in the lead up to the US joining the Second World War. Well, if you did, unfortunately you'd be wrong, as the cause was a minor design flaw and an unfortunate gust of wind. Okay, it wasn't as simple as that, but the lessons learnt would influence every large structure built afterwards. Ever since 1889, there has been a need for a connection between Tacoma and the Kitsap Peninsula in Washington State. Originally, the idea of a trestle bridge was floated by the Northern Pacific Railroad Company, but the plan didn't come to fruition. A more serious plan was put forward in 1923, with the Chamber of Commerce attempting to find financing for the project. During the initial stages of gaining support, the appointed Washington State Toll Bridge Authority found that a crossing bridge would not be able to cover the costs of construction from collecting tolls alone. Once again, the project looked like it could not go ahead. However, the nearby Puget Sound Naval Yard and Fort Lewis, run by the Navy and Army respectively, showed great interest in the crossing. Backed by the armed forces, the toll authority requested 13 million from the federal government to design and build a crossing, and engineer Clark Eldridge was appointed to design a preliminary concept for a suspension bridge, which would feature 7.6 metre deep trusses to stiffen the underside of the roadway. However, another engineer, Leon Moisef, veteran of the Golden Gate Bridge project, proposed a much cheaper and sleeker design. Leon's idea would use much smaller road trusses of only 2.4 metres. This would reduce the cost of the bridge from around 11 million down to a much more affordable 8 million. The strength of the cables was thought to be able to offset the wind pressure on the bridge and in doing so transfer the stress to the anchor. The bridge would have a span of 850 metres making it the third largest suspension bridge in the world. Even though the bridge was rather long it was only predicted to have light traffic flow and due to this the design only allowed for a 12 meter narrow two lane roadway. As well as being narrow, the roadway was also very shallow due to the cheaper to construct 2.4 meter trusses. It was these seemingly minor but visually appealing design decisions would cause problems for the bridge's short life due to flexibility of the roadway. As with most government dealings, the cheaper bid got the contract. The Public Works Administration approved six million for the construction project, with the remaining balance of eight million to be collected from toll crossings after completion. With a go-ahead given and Moisef's design planned out, construction works began on the 27th of September, 1938. The construction project took 19 months and at a cost of 6.4 million dollars. Even as the project was being built, stability issues due to the shallow roadway caused workers to dub the bridge Galloping Gertie, as she swayed in even mild wind. The bridge twisted opposite sides of the centre span as the overly flexible roadway danced in the wind. Even before opening day, the bridge began to become infamous for its unwanted vertical movement. On the 1st of July 1940, Galloping Gertie was open to the public. As the first vehicles navigated the bridge, noticeable bouncing could be seen. Quickly she became a tourist attraction as the public came to see the bridge bounce around as people timidly crossed the span. Due to the entertaining experience of the bridge, many film cameras captured the new building's bizarre behaviours. Several attempts to design out the unwanted movement were implemented by attaching cables to the bridge attached to 50 tonne concrete blocks. However, the cables to the block snapped soon after installation. Another set of cables were installed, although this time they didn't snap, but still proved ineffective. The bridge also had hydraulic buffers installed where the towers met the roadway, but again these had little effect to the unwanted movement. Gathering winds from the southwest on the morning of the 7th of November 1940 started to create oscillations. Gradually the bridge flexed as it had done before as the winds reached 38 miles per hour at 7.30am. But after each movement the roadway bobbled higher and higher up to heights of 5 feet as it caught in the wind. 
Clark Eldridge, one of the original bridge designers, drove across the bridge at 8.30 en route to his office. By 9.30, the winds hit 42 miles an hour, and scientist Professor F.B. Farquharson arrived at the bridge. Within two hours, the bridge would be in ruins. Now, Mr. Farquharson is worth mentioning here, as he had been employed to try and tackle the Galloping Gertie once and for all, and he was only days away from fixing the bridge. It was discovered during experiments in a wind tunnel that the weak roadway and poor aerodynamic properties were the cause of the oscillation. Frederick Farquharson proposed on the 2nd of November two fixes. One would include cutting holes in the roadway girders to allow air to pass through, eliminating the unwanted movement. This was not favoured by the Tollbridge Authority as it was permanent and a destructive fix. As an alternative and less invasive fix, Farquharson proposed fitting fairings to the side of the bridge to help airflow around the roadway, much like a wing, but time had run out. Back to the fateful day and the professor tasked with fixing the bridge could only stand by and watch as the structure swayed uncontrollably in the wind. He set up a motion picture camera to capture the unfolding disaster. For the next half an hour leading up to 10am, the last few cars braved the bridge and paid their tolls. Two more vehicles would attempt to traverse the bridge, a delivery van from the Rapid Transfer Company and a car. Neither would complete their journey. The transfer van would be toppled over by the West Tower with its driver and passenger escaping on foot. The car driven by Leonard Coatsworth and news editor for the Tacoma News Tribune and his daughter's dog Tubby managed to get as far as the East Tower when a jolt from the bridge threw the car into the curb. Coatsworth escaped and started crawling towards the East Tower. Eventually he made it to the safety of the toll plaza and told a member of staff about his dog and then contacted the office, which in turn dispatched one of their photographers to capitalise on the unfolding disaster. Eldridge arrived at the scene at 10.15am after receiving a phone call saying the bridge was about to go. By 10.30, parts of the bridge were starting to fall off. Some workmen managed to save the two from the topple van. As the winds started to lull, one of the photographers from the News Tribune, Howard Clifford, braved his way onto the bridge to try and rescue the dog Tubby stranded inside Coatsworth's car, but he couldn't get close enough. Farquharson, who was still taking photos, decided to try to reach the car at 10.55am to rescue the dog. He opened the door to find a terrified Tubby, who then went to bite Farquharson's finger. Unsuccessful, he retreated back to safety. At 10am, larger and larger bits of concrete were launched into the air as the bridge ripped itself to pieces. Steel girders bent like rubber, bolts shot off like bullets in all directions as suspension cables whipped around like a fishing line. As the building tore itself to shreds, hundreds gathered to watch the destruction firsthand. At 11.02, the bridge finally gave out and a 182 metre stretch broke free, falling into the Puget below. Cables cracked through the air and sparks spat out from damaged electrical wiring. Farquharson on the East Tower scrambled for his life, reaching the toll plaza as several sections plunged into the water. Coatsworth's stranded car with Tubby still inside disappeared into the narrows, never to be seen again. By 11.10am, it was all over, with the East and West Towers standing with only disfigured cables dangling along the once grand centre span of the bridge. In the aftermath, an inquiry was set up to understand the cause of the collapse and to find who was at fault for such an embarrassing demise of a publicly funded project. Eldridge was quick to point the finger at the moneylenders for using a cheaper design and pointed out that he had opposed Moisef's design due to the 2.4 metre girders acting like sails in the wind, telling newspapers the men who held the purse strings were the whip crackers for the entire project. We had a tried and true conventional bridge design. We were told we couldn't have the necessary money without using plans furnished from an eastern firm of engineers, chosen by the moneylenders. The Public Works Administration officials claimed that they had heard no such objections from the engineering team about the bridge's design. However, barely two months had passed before one of the administration's own engineers, David Glenn, blew the whistle to say that he had refused to approve the bridge in July 1940, even submitting a report rejecting the bridge for use, citing fatal design flaws. The PWA and the Toll Authority ignored the report and accepted the completed structure. 
Two weeks after Glenn came forward, he was fired from the PWA. The Federal Works Administration appointed a panel of three engineers to investigate the collapse. No single person was blamed, but instead highlighted three causes for the incident. The first being the bridge's flexibility due to the relatively small support girders. The second issue was the roadway deck acting like an aerofoil, causing lift and drag, which was the reason for the twisting motion. Finally, the engineer's lack of understanding of the potential aerodynamic capabilities of a bridge which could have been solved by wind tunnel testing of potential design. Chief designer Liam Mosseff was let off the hook, however his career was in tatters, and the shambles of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge would shadow him for the rest of his life until his death in 1943. Eldridge was not so forgiving, scolding Mosseff for designing a bridge for no more than 7 million, in doing so undercutting the original more thicker girded expensive design. Soon after, Eldridge would quit his job and start working for the US Navy on the island of Guam. Bizarrely, he would be captured by the Japanese during World War II and whilst in a POW camp, would be recognised by one of the Japanese officers who had studied in the US, who in turn approached Eldridge only to say Tacoma Bridge. Controversially, not all the money for the bridge could be recovered from the insurers straight away as it was claimed that the towers and cables could be reused, and because of this the underwriters offered a meagre 1.8 million. Unsurprisingly, the state filed a dispute trying to recover at least 4.3 million dollars. After a nine month battle, both sides agreed on a payout of 4 million. This delay stopped any project for a replacement in its tracks, as the US entered the Second World War. A second bridge would be built after the war, opening in 1950, and would closely resemble the original design by Eldridge. And Farquharson would play a part in the new bridge's design with his testing of scale models in wind tunnels. Many lessons were learnt from the first Tacoma Narris bridge collapse, helping to improve design and construction of all suspension bridges built since. And it was lucky to have only had a death toll of one, poor old Tubby the dog. Thank you so much for watching, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks again for Tim for suggesting this subject. Please help the channel grow by liking, commenting, subscribing and also sharing. Also keep up to date with new videos by hitting the bell icon. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching.